20 years ago, cybersecurity was something that only nerds talked about. Now cybersecurity has gone mainstream. Listen in as we talk common scams, the recent Twitter hack, and organized crime with Graham Cluley from the Smashing Security Podcast. Graham has been working in the computer security industry since the early 1990s. He was in senior roles with Sophos and McAfee. In 2011, he was inducted into the InfoSecurity Europe Hall of Fame. In recent years, he's been having fun as an independent cybersecurity blogger, podcaster, public speaker, and talking to the media about security issues. I'm your host, Chris Parker, and this is the Easy Prey Podcast. Graham, thank you so much for coming on the Easy Prey Podcast. I really appreciate your time for you this evening, for me this morning. <laughs> it's my, absolutely my pleasure, Chris. Thank you for having me on the show. So can you give me a little background about how you got involved in uh, IT security? Oh, my goodness. It's a crazy story. Um, I was once a poor, impoverished computer programming student, and my girlfriend uh, at the time was studying uh, overseas, and uh, I wanted some money to uh, be able to go and visit her. So I wrote some shareware games. And at the end of these games, which I wrote, if you remember Shareware, the whole concept was you, you sort of gave the games to each other. And if you liked them, you would send me some money. So I imagine no one would ever do that, right? No one will ever send money. So what I did was at the end of the games, I displayed a poor, a very sad, romantic message about how far away I was from my girlfriend and how I was poor and impoverished. And all I wanted to do was collect some money to go and buy some cheesy biscuits or, or go and fly and see her. And I did all this to the tune of Love Story. So it played the do 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 through your speaker while it was doing it. And amazingly, people did. People sent me money through the post. You know, they wrote a check and put it in an envelope and sent it to me before e-commerce existed. And one day, a great big parcel arrived containing a packet of cheesy biscuits, so I didn't have to buy them containing a check for £20, which is more than I was asking for, and it had a letter inside it saying, if you want a job, give me a call. And the person who sent that letter was a guy called Alan Solomon, who wrote the leading European antivirus product at the time, Dr. Solomon's Antivirus Toolkit, and I became his first Windows programmer as a result. That is a great story. <laughs> It's bonkers, isn't it? I mean, you know, what, what a strange thing. And I, I've been doing this now for coming on for 30 years um, ever since then. And the world has changed enormously because when I began, there were around about 200 new computer viruses every month. Um, and people used to think, oh, you know, how, how are you going to cope when there are thousands and thousands of viruses? Because we used to send out uh, antivirus updates. We didn't send them out via the internet because that most people didn't have an internet connection. We used to send them by the post in an envelope. Oh my goodness! <laughs> and so that used to go out on a three hundred and sixty k five and a quarter inch floppy disk, if you remember those. And then, then one day there were so many viruses with so many definitions in our database that we had to go to uh, one point two megabyte floppy disks. And then we went to the three and a half inch floppy disks as well. So today there are literally hundreds of thousands of new pieces of malware being written every day it, it, every you know in a blink of an eye there's more than one new piece of malware being released so the problem has grown enormously it used to be kids in their back bedrooms to be honest those were the good old fun days <laughs> and they probably still are kids in their bedrooms a lot of them there's there's pro well yes as we've recently seen there's obviously still some teenage hacking which is going on but of course the ramifications if they're caught are considerable today Yes. And we see much more organized crime and, of course, state-sponsored cybercrime. That, that's the kind of thing which is – when I started, the thought that the Russian government or the American government or the, even the Greeks have written a Trojan horse, you know, the thought that they would do that kind of thing was just pure science fiction and James Bond. But now, don't even blink about it. Yeah, of course they do. Of course they're all using the internet to hack each other. Yeah, that, that, I mean, it's amazing to think that it's scaled up and grown so exponentially in such yeah. a short period of time. I mean, and obviously the methodology of identifying viruses and malware have changed. You're now looking for behavior as opposed to chunks of code, I assume. Yeah, that's right. I mean, we, we never really, I mean, even in the very early days, I, mean, I remember way back in like 1991, we weren't looking for a sequence of bytes. It wasn't like there was a 
we weren't doing like a grep of files because that would be prone to false alarming. So there were more sophisticated techniques than that. But today's modern antivirus software not only can specifically identify particular families of malware, but it has heuristics. It looks at behaviors. Um, one of the there's a variety of methods you can use to stop ransomware, for instance, which is the, the kind of malware which encrypts your files, stops you accessing them. Well, you that's unusual behavior for lots of your files to suddenly be accessed and be changed is rather peculiar. And so antivirus software can identify that and say, whoa, something a wee bit odd going on here. Maybe this is ransomware. So all kinds of tricks which you can use. But um, I do kind of miss the days when it was only teenage boys without girlfriends writing malware. And <laughs> the, the organized criminals, uh, they don't have so much of a flourish when it comes to writing the malware. It's not as much fun. Well, they're, they're not trying to show off in the same way. No, no. I mean, and that's really what was driving them. Back in those days, it wasn't about making money. It was about, you know, you called yourself a name like the Dark Avenger, Slarty Bartfast, Apache Warrior. You would have these grandiose names like you were members of the World Wrestling Federation. And, uh, <laughs> and of course, you would do something on the screen. You would put up a skull and crossbones. Thing. Interestingly, by the way, ransomware is the one kind of malware which throws back to that old malware of being very visual because it wants you to know it I've done something. Yes, it, it's disastrous for ransomware if it, if you don't realize that you've been infected, right? It's like, how are they going to get the money? So they will do something dramatic, but most malware doesn't do that. Most malware is very stealthy. It's insidious. They want to infect you. And maybe they want to infect you for months before you realize that your files are being stolen or they're spying on your activity or stealing parts. Yeah, I mean, the most malicious event is one where you've been compromised and you don't and you never know about it where they're slowly just skimming off information and so yeah. you can't tie it back to well this event happened on this day that's when i was compromised it could have been three months ago could have been six months and, and i assume that's a lot more of the the nation state hacking is looking for we just want to be able to watch what's going on over the long haul to see what you're doing and how you're doing it they're they're playing the long game you know, they don't want to draw attention to themselves. There's an old joke, which is, um, you know, it, it, there's two kinds of companies. There's the companies who've been hacked and there's the companies who don't realize they've already been hacked. <laughs> but they're going to find out sooner or later that they've got a problem as well. Um, but, but you're right. I mean, I can remember some attacks which have happened. There was one, I think it was, um, I think it was Chinese hackers who targeted the New York Times um, some years ago. And they were sort of inside the New York Times is content management system, their CMS, which meant that they were able to change stories. But also, critically for them, they were able to see stories as they were being drafted and the work which the journalists were doing. And there was a huge concern that maybe journalists' notes about secret informants um, and such like might be falling into the hands of an oppressive state, which might abuse that kind of information. So, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, that I think it, it, it is much more frightening. The good news is most companies, you know, there's not much you can do about a state-sponsored attack, to be honest. If, if they're determined to get in, yeah. if they really want to get in, I mean, at the, at the simplest level, they when you put out a job advert and say, we want a new guy in our IT team, uh, a state-sponsored attacker could, if they wanted, I'm apply for, for a that job. job. Yeah. Yeah. And then you've given them all the passwords and you've given them the physical access and they could do all kinds of mischief inside there. So they could do that, uh, but they also have lots of other resources. And that. What I say to people is don't be too complacent, though, because even if you think, well, why would they want to? Why would they want, you know, maybe you're a company making mattresses, for instance. Why would the Russians or the Chinese or whoever, the Belgians, want to hack my, my uh, bed making company? Well, it might be that they're actually interested in some of your suppliers or some of your customers. And you might be the weak link through which they come in in order to try and target those people instead. And we're actually starting to see a lot of scams working that way, that when their uh, company A is sending a document to company B, the hackers are intercepting that document, throwing some malware in it, and then sending it, sending it on its happy little way. And so here's yeah. this perfectly expected 
interaction between two entities with a document that looks and feels like the document that it's supposed to be. No one, no one's any of the wiser that this is slowly propagating itself. Yeah, through companies. That, 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 that's right, Chris. And I mean, it's. It, I find it frustrating sometimes that people say, "Oh, well, I can spot a scam email because it'll be badly spelt, or they make some grammatical error." And it's like, well, you know, if someone's really determined, it will look like that company. They will forge the email properly. They will take. Pr- previous emails maybe or they may have already hacked your email system and seen other communications which are happening between your company and your supplier so they can actually jump onto the email chain onto the thread and suddenly say by the way our bank details have changed or here's the invoice for the work which we've been doing that's what we're seeing with business email compromise scams which i think are actually probably a much bigger threat than ransomware to most companies at the moment because of the millions and millions which you can lose. These are the scams where the bad guys find out who your suppliers are, who you're, who you're giving contracts to, and then they pretend to be that contractor. And they contact your finance department saying, we finished the work. Um, here's our bill. And your finance department say, has the work been finished? They said to you. And you say, yep, it has been finished. You know, uh, are you happy to pay them? Yeah, we're happy to pay them. They've done a great job. And then the money goes into the wrong bank account. And companies have lost millions because of that. And and well, you know, smart people. It's not just the – Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, we're talking major corporations are losing millions of dollars to these types of scams. I think Facebook and Google have said they've lost over $100 million <sighs> to precisely those kind of scams. So, you know, th- those are smart guys, right? You expect them to be well protected. But – you know, you can have all the defenses in place in the world. You can have all the layers of security. You can have all the patches in place, but you can't patch the old human brain. Yep. I- and so, <laughs> you know, pe- people will be distracted or, you know, busy that day or they've got a screaming kid because they're working at home and they're not properly paying attention and click, you've clicked on the wrong thing and bam, it's too late. I, I know someone personally that um, his accountant got an email that looked like it came from him. They had gone out and registered a domain name that was similar to the corporate domain name. They had yep. obviously had converse, had an email conversation with him because they knew who the accountant was, how he normally addressed her. They had his exact email signature. And so they fired off an email. Hey, this is so-and-so. Hey, I'm on a conference call uh, with someone, it's really important that I need to send out this wire transfer. Um, you know, h- here's the account details. I'm on the f- I'm on the phone. Don't don't bug me. We'll talk about it afterwards. But I need you to send it right now. Yeah. And so she gets it. It looks like his regular email signature. It's not. It wasn't a. You know, it wasn't a six figure amount of money. It was a, a few thousand dollars. And so she happily starts going along and doing it, and then realized. Oh, wait, we're in the process of kind of transitioning bank accounts. I need to figure out which bank account that he wants me to send it from, the new one, the old one. And so the real guy sticks his head out of his office and she goes, oh, hey, so-and-so, uh, which account did you want me to send that money from? And he's like, well, what are you talking about? Well, you sent wow. me the email saying to transfer the money. I didn't send you an email. <laughs> they called me up and, hey, we've been hacked. And I'm like, well, let me look at it. I'm like, no, it's, it's fake email. <laughs> Yeah, and you, you don't have to be that sophisticated to do one of those attacks. You know, remember all those letters from Nigeria we used to get? And to be honest, there's still used some of to? those going used on. Used to? Okay. But they, they, I, personally, I'm not getting as many as I as I used to. Maybe they've taken me off their list. But, you know, that whole inheritance or we've identified that you are the sole survivor, you know, well, the, the descendant of someone who died in a car crash. Um, now, you know, all those were were emails. And all business email compromise at the simplest level, at least, is email. Yeah. And the truth is you can make millions out of it. And obviously they do because these scams have proliferated for decades now. Yeah. Yeah. Very successful. So when I speak to businesses about the biggest threats that should be keeping them awake, it's not zero day threats. It's not APTs. Um, Things like ransomware are a threat, but I actually think this business email compromise is is a much bigger threat. And so training all your staff to be wise to those kind of threats and having, I think, an atmosphere inside your organization that 
it's all right to say no to the CEO. It's all right to say no to people or I'll have a procedure. And if anyone tries to break the procedure when a bank account changes or something like that, then that's a big problem. And so you, you have to be prepared to say to your senior management, you know, thank you for telling me to do that. But we've got a rule, as you know, which always has to be abided by. That was the suggest that was the exact suggestion I had for that was you need to put in a rule in place that some specific paperwork has to be completed, neither faxed or handed over in person. Anytime a new account was being set up, anytime an invoice an invoice was outside of its normal range, it's just yeah. it's just part of the process. So yeah. it's, it's really that kind of the, the humans unfortunately are always the weakest link. And sadly, it's often the bosses. It's often the people at the very top who think the rules don't apply to them. Or indeed, if even if they're not obeying the rules, you know, and they're sticking USB sticks or downloading who knows what from the Internet. If they're not obeying the rules in so much as they're trying to make their own staff usurp their security systems to get something done quickly, they should be grateful that those employees are obeying the regulations and the practices <laughs> because they're saving that company's bacon. Yeah. So I, I know you've talked about it, but this really ties a lot in with the the the, twi the I would say the Twitter hack. I'm not sure that it was really a hack in that sense uh, with the Bitcoin Twitter posts from world renowned yeah. million follower accounts of people that you wouldn't expect to be sending out. Hey, I'm going to double your money if you send me some Bitcoin. <laughs> It was bizarre, wasn't it? So first of all, we saw um, Coinbase and Binance who, you know, cryptocurrency exchanges. So maybe it's plausible that if they say send X number of Bitcoin to us, we will send you X back for a limited amount. Maybe that's plausible as some kind of, I don't know, good for the world because we all need some cheering up at the moment. But when you then saw Barack Obama and Elon Musk and Bill Gates and Apple. Kanye West <laughs> <laughs> and all the rest of them saying the same thing. You kind of think, hmm, not so sure about this now. It's, it's um, a collaborative but, effort. <laughs> well, it, yeah. Well, the last time celebrities collaborated, of course, was when Gal Gadot <laughs> got together with her celebrity chums to sing Imagine. And we know how disastrous <laughs> that was. So <laughs> the thought that they would now do this for crypto. Some, and, and obviously, and amazingly, uh, over $100,000 worth got transferred into the bad guys' accounts as a result. They, it, uh, interestingly, Coinbase actually spotted it really quickly and they froze payments. Um, so there would have been another 280,000, which would have got there if they hadn't acted so quickly. So maybe it wasn't a good idea. The hackers actually hacked Coinbase's account as well. But what's interesting is that these guys were able to gain access to Twitter's internal systems in order to hack into Joe Biden or Barack Obama's account. It wasn't that those people had weak security you know, they, they probably do have two-factor authentication. They probably do have a strong password on their accounts. But Twitter had something like a thousand members of staff and contractors who had access to an internal tool, which meant they could basically access anybody's account and do what they wanted with it. It was the infamous God mode. Right. You know, which and uh, why do a thousand people need to be just a bit crazy? that they were doing that. So I think there's some egg on the face of Twitter there. But obviously what the bat, what these kids did, and it was kids, it turns out, who were behind this, it appears. Um, what they did was they socially engineered people. They sent emails. They, they communicated, whether it be by phone or email or web or whatever, with these Twitter members of staff claiming to be the IT department, it seems, and getting them to log into a system. And it was a fake system, which meant that when those Twitter members of staff entered their passwords and their 2FA code, the hackers were able to type it in in real time on the real site in order to gain access to the internal system. I, I've heard of a bank scam that followed a, some similar lines. We'll talk about that in a minute. Right. Yeah. It's, it's you know, extraordinary that this, this was – and you, you do kind of think, well, hang on a moment. That, that This shouldn't have been possible because there should have been – Stuff like GOIP locking, maybe they should have locked down ranges of what computers are actually allowed to access Twitter's internal systems. But if you have a thousand members of staff, it's probably quite hard to police that and manage it. 
and you, keep it up to date. You'd think they would have to be in a corporate VPN in order to access this internal system and not just be able to you publicly think, ask, access it. Yeah, we don't know about all the details yeah, exactly. Maybe yeah. they, uh, uh, they got an account for the VPN as well. Well, maybe they did. You know, maybe they managed to infect an employee's computer and then use that as a proxy. It, it's, yeah. no, to be honest, it's a little bit frustrating that we don't have more information from Twitter at the moment. But I, <laughs> I can well understand that they're just making sure everything is battened down. So they don't want to have another one of those happen. It's going to yeah. be bad for the company. There was a, uh, I remember reading about a bank scam that kind of followed the same uh, functionality where mm. the scammers would contact a person via SMS and say, Hey, your, your account has been compromised and start. And Hey, this is a live chat. We're going to chat with you to, to get this resolved. And we need you to log into your account. Right. And so when the person logged into the account, it would send a two of a, Oh yeah. And, and the person, and so the, 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 the scammers say, can you read back the two of a to confirm that you got it? We're going to confirm verbally that you got it. So now the scammer has logged into your account with the two-factor authentication. And the scammer in the background is saying, oh, gosh, it looks like they're in your bank account right now. And what the scammer would do is set up a wire transfer, which would initiate another SMS message, which says, hey, do you approve setting up this account? And they would perfectly time that with a message of, Hey, we need you to press one for us to lock your account to get them out. And they had this whole thing just timed just right. So the bank is texting them. The the fake agent is texting them, thinking it's a real life scenario playing out right in front of them. They think yeah. they're helping protect their own account, whether they're in fact enabling the scammer to get into the account, set up the transfers, approve them, and send the money away. I uh, yeah. I mean you're absolutely right. Those sort of things happen. I really feel sorry for the non-nerds out there, right? How's my auntie supposed to cope with something like that? How are you supposed to warn her about? I mean, you can say, you know, be care be wary of unsolicited phone calls or text messages. And did you know that even though the text message says it comes from your bank, it may not be because that is for you just end up with such a long list of instructions and caveats that people end up petrified of using technology yeah because they think they're going to get hacked all the time so oh well you know and, and i think that's the real tragedy of cybercrime is that there are little old ladies who can no longer speak to their grandchildren on the other side of the planet because they don't want to have a computer they don't want to have a webcam and because they've had bad experiences in the past and they think well why am i even bothering with this it's just all too complicated that that is a really unfortunate side effect. It's uh, I'm going to throw up my hands. I don't want to deal with it. It's too much of a risk. Yeah, yeah. It, it, and you know, I mean, I think all of us who work in technology, we found ourselves in the situation where we are the tech support team for the rest of the family, right? And I, I can't some... relate at all. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and there are some things which I'm really good at with IT, right? Where which I know inside out. Other times, I get a. You no, know, like my brother-in-law will come round with something, and it's like I know nothing about this particular area of IT. Oh, but you're the computer expert. So, well, I know about this area of computing. I don't know anything about this area over here. And it, you know, it's a challenge as to how we're meant to protect people. I mean, obviously, I, I do my best for my neighbours and for my family, but there are times when you just think, you know, what what may be actually easiest is maybe you should just get an iPad. <laughs> Or something like that, or or a Chrome laptop, or something a little bit more locked down. Yep. So although there are still threats, there's, you'd still be fished, and you know all, all, all kinds of things like that. At least you don't have to worry so much about malware infecting your system and uh, and, and ransomware and things like that. Yeah, I mean that that is a really good recommendation, and for most people, they're really only using their device for email, a little yeah. bit of banking chatting with family, surfing the web. And so a really locked yeah. down device really is a really good option for a lot of people. Yeah, I think 90% of what people do, in, you know, is going to be doing a little bit of online shopping, maybe on just Amazon or, or eBay and some social networking probably as well. A bit of email, a bit of FaceTime and bingo, you're pretty happy. Yeah, it was funny. Earlier you were talking about um, 
your antivirus or the antivirus is looking for kind of unusual behavior. Mm. Uh, I was having a conversation with a previous guest and he had written some AI to monitor domain names that may be suspicious. Yeah. And he realized that his whole machine learning AI blew up because of COVID-19. <laughs> because all of a sudden, all these government entities are creating these COVID-related websites. Yes. <laughs> and, and, you know, not paying a whole lot of attention to what they're doing. And it's like, yeah, you know, unusual behavior is good and bad. I mean, it's it's a spottable yeah. event and it's not a spottable event. So, so suddenly, suddenly everyone was getting directed to websites, which maybe have only been up to, you know, up there for a week or two. And normally you would steer clear <laughs> like anything. It's like that, that suspiciously new website. Yeah. But, and you wouldn't yeah. have all of a sudden lots of government entities linking to these websites that just came out uh -huh. overnight. That that smacks of a hack. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> now, you could also like mention that Coinbase, uh, Coinbase noticed unusual behavior. Was mm. it that they just saw that it was their account? that was used to promote a particular Bitcoin account and locked it because of that? Or was there actually some fundamental behavior that they saw that was unusual about the Bitcoin transactions? I, I think uh, it was primarily actually their Twitter account being hacked. I would imagine there are so many transactions happening on Coinbase all the time that the relatively small amount of activity which had happened, I think they spotted it within about 13 minutes. I don't think... Uh, any sort of algorithm that they're running would have spotted that quite so quickly. Maybe if a larger number of people had begun to do it, then perhaps. But I, I think it was more the fact that the hackers um, actually uh, def def defaced their Twitter account effectively. It's interesting, by the way, everyone talks about the cryptocurrency hack being the thing which the hackers did. It sounds like there was more than one hacker who had access to that internal system and may have had access for a while and might have abused it in different ways. It appears there was also, for instance, a uh, right wing uh, politician. I think he was in the Netherlands who had his account defaced in other ways as well. Hmm. It wasn't actually the cryptocurrency thing, but I think they were trying to embarrass him and, uh, and obviously bring him into even more disrepute than he already is in. Um, but uh, so there was that. There was also a fair amount of uh, selling of access to accounts. So one of the attractive things for hackers sometimes is they, they want a Twitter account with a really short name. Yeah. So wouldn't it be cool to have a three letter name or two letter name on Twitter? And if, if you are someone who has the misfortune of having a Twitter account with a two or three letter name, you are more likely, I suspect, to be targeted by an attack than if you have one of those ridiculously long names, which some of us have. I, I have a domain name that I bought back, gosh, early 90s, uh, yeah. a four-letter domain name. I won't say what it is, uh, that I have the .com, the .net, the .org. I have all of them. And it's not, you know, QQ8B. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and I routinely get people trying to... Uh, you know, generate fake transfer requests yeah. and, and try to get into the account where it's host, where it's uh, registered because it's that a four yeah. letter domain name that's been around now for 30 years almost. Well, right. So it has, so it has history as well. Yeah. So, I mean, it, 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 if, if anyone is running some code or uh, a suite, which actually looks to see how old the, the domain is to try and verify whether it may be legitimate or not, that obviously works to its advantage. That it does. You had talked about organized crime as well. Mm. Any news stories recently about organized crime kind of moving into cyberspace? Oh, my goodness. I think every criminal gang is uh, moving into cyber in, in such a big way. We see this astonishing group at the moment called Evil Corp. Are you familiar with them? I have heard of Evil Corp. Yeah. So Evil Corp are the guys years and years ago, they did the Zeus banking trojan which was a very effective trojan horse designed to steal your credentials from your online banking site um, and it was a, a menace for many many people then they moved into another piece of malware called drydex and most recently they uh look they've been launching very targeted attacks ransomware attacks against companies now 
ransomware has changed in its nature in a few ways in the last couple of years. One of the most worrying things is that ransomware attackers now aren't just encrypting your data, they're also stealing it. Yeah. And that's to, so there's an extra incentive for companies to pay up because otherwise the bad guys say they will release the data. Um, I, for instance, I, I, so I run a news, a security news website. I've contacted by hackers before who say, we've hacked so and so. Here is their data. We think you'll find it really interesting. Here are some bits which you think you could write stories about. Now, my personal view is I'm not going to help the bad guys with their extortion. So I refuse to write about that kind of thing. We know th this is stolen data. I don't want to go through the minutiae of it. And, you know, it just, it just leaves. A there are plenty of news websites yes. out there who will do it <laughs> for the clicks, but I'm not going to do it. Um, now, thankfully, Evil Corp aren't stealing data, which makes them unusual. But they did just hit Garmin, of course, which are known for their fitness trackers. And uh, they're also used in aviation and shipping, and all kinds of other things as well. And Garmin went down for a few days. And rumor has it, uh, they were asked for $10 million. Ooh. And it's just been confirmed, as we're recording this at least, uh, it's just been confirmed that Garmin went to an intermediary company uh, who negotiated the ransom on their behalf, uh, which means that the company can basically say, oh, we haven't paid the cyber criminals. <laughs> we paid this other company to pay them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You find out what they, we don't know what they did, but they've come up with the decryptor for us mysteriously afterwards. And the reason why that's particularly relevant is that Evil Corp is based in Russia. And last December, I think it was, the Department of Justice in the United States, um, they, they, they have... They're basically after a few members uh, of Evil Corp, including their leader, whose name is Maxim Yakubets. And there are actual sanctions now in place so that you are not allowed to pay Evil Corp. So if you get hit by ransomware by them, you're legally not supposed to pay them at all. It's not like regular ransomware. It's like you, you do not pay that company. You do not do business with them. Hence, it's quite good to have this intermediary. Fascinating thing about this chap, Maxim Yakubets is that he's living very openly in in Moscow. He has incredibly expensive fast cars. And he goes imagine. around doing donuts. He does donuts around the Kremlin. The, the local traffic police stop him, then realize who he is, because he is married to uh, the daughter of a senior member of the FSB. Oh, wow. And so however much America right now might want to get their hands on him, my suspicion is the powers that be in Russia are not going to move very much. I think you should um, also be worried about the FSB connection and that if, if this person has so much connection to the someone in the intelligence community that I wonder if there's another strain of what his company, what Evil Corp is producing, which is actually used for espionage. Well, maybe. I mean, they, they, who can say, right? Who can say? Certainly, they've got expertise in some areas, and they've been very effective at hacking different companies, finding vulnerabilities, getting in and causing mayhem and making themselves a large amount of money. There's another interesting potential business angle as well. I, I mentioned that some companies exist, and they say, we are the ransomware negotiators. So um, if you don't want to pay the bad guys, if you think that look bad PR wise, pay us instead. You may even pay us more than the extortionists want, and we will work on getting a decryption for you. And of course, what they do is they go to the criminals and get it off them. And they've made a nice little profit. Now, if you were a cyber criminal gang for which there were sanctions against you, you could just set up another company, couldn't you? <laughs> and say, <laughs> we are experts at negotiating with Evil Corp. Why and we and we're based in the Maldives or whatever, yes, uh, yeah. wherever no, the sanctions don't apply. <laughs> I, I, I want to stress, I'm not saying that, that this has happened in this particular instance, but it's just the way my devious mind works. Uh, a way for them to get even more money out of you is to be the intermediary as well. That That's, yeah, yeah. I, I could very much see that as being the fact. And I've always kind of... The devious part of my mind thinks back like, OK, so we're talking privacy and security, um, a VPN company. Gosh, you know, the CIA has got an awful lot of money. They should just spin up a 
a world renowned yeah. VPN company. We can have really good rates, <laughs> really good servers, and we're right in the middle of it all to snag any data that we want. CA has been known to run, you know, business business entities before, and so right. uh, no reason why it wouldn't do it now. There's been such a furore over the years about, you know, American intelligence maybe hacking large technology companies or having backdoors into them and ha how they could use that, you know, some of the Snowden revelations. Well, maybe it's a lot less effort to create something like a VPN company <laughs> and keep the logs as to who's doing what. I, it, VPNs are fascinating because I'm now getting people who, in my extended family, who aren't nerds, who've heard of VPNs. Mm -hmm. And they're saying to me, should I be running a VPN, Graham? And I'm thinking, well, why do you why do you want to run a VPN? Explain to me first of all why you want it, and it's mostly because like, oh, it'll stop me getting hacked. It's like no, 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 it doesn't stop you getting no, hacked. Not really. <laughs> what it's done do is it's going to route your internet traffic rather than being through your ISP. It's going to route through somebody else who you hope is going to be legitimate and isn't going to keep logs. And I think there are some decent VPN companies, but there's also some who. I find quite shady. Yes. Well, it, it's... Including some big names who I won't mention, but <laughs> I'm like, oh, I'm not sure I like you guys. You know, it's, it's all a question of who do you distrust more? Your, <laughs> the ISP or the network that you're getting on, the government of that entity, or the VPN company. In some cases, you might go, well, the VPN's the lesser... Uh, yeah. Even if they are monetizing my data and kind of injecting a little bit in there, modifying ads or whatever like that. At least it's not my ISP sneaking on me and it's not my government monitoring me. Unless, of course, the VPN is owned I mean, by the government. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, I do, there, there are situations where I do use a VPN uh, and, uh, you know, I'm very, very happy to. But um, it, it's you know, some, we have this situation at the moment because we have GDPR, as you know. Mm -hmm. So you know, there's all kinds of data regulations uh, here in Europe. And uh, American companies, I think some of them were caught on the, on the <laughs> sort of didn't realize that it also applied to them if, if they were on the web and if they had European customers. So I find there's quite a few now U.S. news websites, which when I try and visit them, they pop up a message saying, because you're coming from Europe, you know, we don't support you at the moment. So you can't re read anything. And it's like, come on, guys, it's been a couple of years now. You should be on top of this. But anyway, um, and so I will use a VPN to pretend to be in America, and then I can obviously access them. And I think people probably do that for, I don't know, Netflix or streaming services as well. Yeah, that, that seems to be one of the most common usages is like, I just want to access some content that either yeah. my government won't let me access, my ISP won't let me access, or the person at the other end is being overly restrictive and just, you know, I don't want to be involved in it. So get a VPN and then visit me. Hmm. But I would certainly love to see less uh, less scaremongering from some of the VPN companies. You know, there, there are VPN companies who say, you know, if you ever connect to the Internet, they can grab bad guys can grab all your passwords. It's like, well, hang on. Most of the Internet now is using SSL. It's HTTPS. So I'm, I'm not convinced that is as huge a problem as you are making out to people. Yeah, I, I think they're overly, uh, overly promoting the security aspects of it. Mm. Yeah, I think definitely in terms of if you're getting on shady Wi-Fi, eh, once you're connecting to yeah, somebody you know, else's network, there there's the ability to man in the middle in well, some like, cases. But it's it's like you were saying, you know, who who do you, what was it you said? Who do you who, trust who do you trust distrust. less <laughs> or, yes. or distrust more? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. But if so, yeah. but, but some, realistically, some if you're in your home and you don't distrust your internet service provider. There's not the you're not going to gain yeah. a whole lot from using a VPN. Yeah. And we are all in our homes right now. Right. <laughs> and we're going to be for some time. So. <laughs> yeah, you have a very valid point there. You're, we're, we're all at home now, unfortunately, all over the world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I think it's about time for us to wrap up here. And I super appreciate your Slarty Bart Fast reference. I don't think there's that many people who, who know who Slarty Bart Fast is. And if you don't, you'll have to Google and find out. It's all about the crinkly fjords, isn't it? Ah, uh, yes, the crinkly fjords. <laughs> Such a great character name. Yeah. 
Well, it's been a pleasure chatting to you, Chris. Any, Thank you very any, much. You're very welcome. Any parting advice for the audience? Oh, my goodness. Uh, just keep yourself abreast of the latest security news, I think. If, if you're listening to Easy Prey, then chances are that you have an interest in staying secure and more private on the internet and being safer and helping your friends. So listen to podcasts like this and, uh, you know, read reputable news sites to find out what the bad guys are up to. And that way you can protect yourself before they manage to target you. Would one of those reputable podcasts to listen to be uh, Smashing Security? Oh, you see, I wasn't going to mention the name of my podcast. I thought that would be too tacky, but yes. <laughs> it's not tacky. So it's not tacky. Once, once you've listened to all of the Easy Prey episodes, <laughs> um, I do a weekly podcast with my co-host, Terrio, called Smashing Security, um, which takes a lighthearted look at uh, the week's cybersecurity news, and we'd be very happy to have more people listening. I think it's always a good way to, to keep abreast of what's going on and, and lighthearted, I think, is what we all need right now. Absolutely. Yeah, don't we just. <laughs> Graham, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate your time. It's been my pleasure. Thanks very much. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Easy Prey podcast. Notes and a transcript of this episode with Graham Cluley can be found at easyprey.com slash 25.